Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. New book today, book of Malachi. Malachi means my messenger, and that's God's messenger, of course. We're going to have five messengers specifically mentioned in this book. You're going to have Malachi is one. Then the true priest, meaning the people who truly teach God's word. John the Baptist, who was the messenger bringing in the first advent. Elijah, who is the messenger who brings in the second advent. And last but not least, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. This Malachi is not dated, but it's likely right about, um, about 340 B.C. And it's, it's after Judah was taken captive, and now they're, they're back in Jerusalem, the tribe of Judah. They're rebuilding the temple, they're, re, they're rebuilding Jerusalem. But then all the priests, they're starting to go astray. And even in, in Ezra chapter 8, verse 15, Ezra takes note. He says, how many Levitical priests do we have with us? And he had zero. The Nethanim had creeped in, meaning the priests got so lazy that they hired the Nethanim to, to chop wood and to do other things, building the temple, rebuilding the city. So the, what that teaches us, if, if you're a preacher, priest, pastor, reverend, whatever you want to call yourself, if you start getting lazy, real bad things are going to happen. And that's basically what this entire book of Malachi is about. It's only four chapters, but it's letting you know about the corrupted preachers and what's going to happen if you go that way and God is not happy about it whatsoever. So let's go ahead and pick it up in Malachi chapter 1. Let's ask the word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for giving us this place we can come and teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, Malachi, my messenger, chapter 1, verse 1. And it reads, The burden, that means the prophetic oracle or the warning of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? You're always going to have people that are ungrateful, don't, don't give God the thanks that he deserves. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, why did God hate Esau? It's written in God's word that he was hateful, even toward his own twin brother. He was envious. He was prideful. He was a fornicator. So God did hate Esau. But do you know what it says in Romans chapter 9, about verses 11 through 14? It says that while Jacob and Esau were even in their mother's womb, God loved Jacob and hated Esau. And many people, they marvel. They say, how could that be? Because they don't understand that there was an earth age before this. Where we were all with God in a spiritual body. So whatever Esau did then, no doubt he was the same way he was in the flesh at that time. He was envious, prideful, hateful. So God hated him for it. But you have to understand there was an earth age before this. And that, that's why God hated Esau. Because of what he did there. But then what it has to do with the, how it mentions his heritage. It says it's going to be laid waste for the dragons of the wilderness. I mean, God will let you go to the devil and the evil spirits if, if you don't love him. If you don't give God the credit that he deserves. If you don't tell him you love him, he'll let you go to the devil. And what, what did Esau do with, with his heritage, with his birthright in Genesis chapter 25 and 27? Esau sold his birthright to Jacob just for a bowl of soup. And as it's written, it says Esau despised his heritage. He despised his birthright. And what is all of our heritage if you love God? It's eternal life. So Esau despised it. He never cared anything about God. He, he would go to his father Isaac for repentance, but he never repented to God. So if you don't love God, and if you just want to leave God out of your life, he'll let you go to the devil if that's what you want to do. Verse 4. Whereas Edom, that, that's Esau, Edom means red. Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, 
and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And he does to those who hate God. They don't want to follow God. They don't want to serve Him. God's going to destroy Him. And even if they might say, oh no, we might have be bad in bad times. We're going to build ourselves right back up. Now if you hate God, you won't. Things might go okay for a little while, but God is going to destroy you if you don't love Him. I mean, He created our very souls. He came in the flesh as the Son, Jesus Christ, and died for us and resurrected, defeating death so we could have eternal life even though none of us are worthy. But then you want to hate God? You don't want to give Him thanks for that? Then go ahead if that's the way you want to go. Verse 5. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. As it's written, when Jesus Christ returns, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess. And when you read this little, uh, The Lord will be magnified, that takes you all the way to Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 23. Where at the very end of this dispensation of time, when the seventh trumpet sounds and those seven vials are poured out, the wrath of God, it's what you also read in Revelation chapter 16. It says God's going to bring down hundred pound hailstones upon the wicked. Why? So God, so they know that God is real. And not, not, not anyone's going to doubt at that time. And like you read in Revelation chapter 19, that's the return of Jesus Christ. Even when they see Christ returning, Satan and the wicked, they all gather around to try to make war against Christ. I mean, what a bunch of idiots. And then that's when those seven vials are poured out, those hundred pound hailstones rain down. And they realize that God is real. And he loves those that love him. But if you hate him, God will destroy you. Verse 6. A son honored his father, or he should, and a servant his master. If I if I if then I be a father, where is mine honor? If I, if I be a master, where is my fear? That word fear means to be in awe of, and we should be in awe of God's glory and his power and his might. Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And you say, Wherein have we despised thy name? That word despise even means to disregard. They disregard God's name. They disregard God's word, even though they claim to be preachers. But then they say, wherein have we despised my name? They say, we have church every Sunday. We praise Jesus. There's only one problem. They don't ever teach God's word. They teach their own words out of their own heart. In Ezekiel chapter 13, that chapter that's all about false prophets, God says, woe to those that prophesy out of their own heart. The foolish ones, they've seen nothing. And many of them even say that God spoke to them when God didn't speak to them. He didn't send them. Jeremiah 23, it speaks about the false prophets that say, Oh, I had a great dream. God gave me this dream. But God says, I didn't send them. I didn't give them that dream. They're just trying to make you think that they're so religious, that they're so holy. But they, see, they don't even realize that they're doing what's wrong. God says he'll send you strong delusion if you go in the way of wickedness. But they think just because they have a church and they claim to praise Jesus, they're doing everything right. Well, not if they're not teaching God's word, they're not. Let's keep going. Verse 7. You offer polluted bread upon mine altar. You see, back this is referring to the time when there was animal sacrifice. But you know from Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, all blood sacrifice and ordinances were nailed to the cross. So what is that today? Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. God says, I don't want your offerings. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your burnt offerings. I don't want your sacrifices. But he wants you to have mercy, which means he wants you to love him. And he wants you to have the knowledge of God. The only way to have the knowledge of God is to study his word. But you see, these false preachers... They offer polluted bread on the altar, meaning that they're claiming to worship God, but they don't do it the way that God told them to. I mean, doing a whole lot of traditions, a whole lot of stuff that seems really religious, but it's polluted because they're not teaching God's word. Making up basically their own religion. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? Like I said, they don't even know they're doing something wrong. Oh, we're praising Jesus, but they're not teaching the word of God. And then you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And why do they do that? Many people say, oh, we're, we have too much religion and too much traditions. We don't really have time to teach God's word. Maybe we'll just teach a verse or two. 
or some preachers will, will even say it's not necessary to even study the Bible. They say, oh, all you got to do is have a relationship with God. Well, having a relationship with God is very, very important. But how can you know how he wants you to serve him if you don't study his word? So they say, oh, don't worry about revelation. You're not even going to be here, which is a lie. And it is so corrupted. Verse 8. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And the answer is, of course not. If you tried to offer something that was sick or polluted to, to, to a man, how do you think God feels about it? And remember, this simply has to do with the way that you worship God. You have to do it how he said it. And God's very clear in Leviticus chapter 10. The main job of the priest is to teach the word of God. And once again, whatever you want to call yourself, preacher, pastor, reverend, priest, whatever, you, your number one job is to teach God's word. But so few churches actually do it, teach the entire Bible exactly as it's written. And you see, most churches, that they wouldn't even touch the book of Malachi. They don't want you to know that there's false prophets. Even though Jesus Christ teaches over and over, many false prophets are gone out into the world. In Mark 13, the very first warning Christ gives is, Take heed, let no man deceive you. There are many false prophets. But the many churches, they don't want you to know that. They want you to think, just because they're a preacher, everything they say is a fact. Well, it's not. There's many false prophets. Verse 9. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This is said in irony. Malachi is saying, yeah, if you want to if you want to offer a corrupt sacrifice, go ahead and pray to God. See if he's going to answer. He won't. This has been by your means. You say, this is your fault, you false preachers. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? That word means regard me to accept. Is he going to accept you? The answer is absolutely not. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says judgment begins at the house of God. You have a much, much more severe wrath coming down on you if you claim to be a preacher than somebody who doesn't. If you teach false doctrine. Verse 10. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle the fire on, on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Check out that little phrase, for not, in your Charles and Cordes. That means for free. God's saying you won't even go and shut the doors for free. You won't even kindle a fire on the altar for free. It's saying no matter what you do, you've got to pass the plate around a few times. God knows that there's so many preachers. That's all they care about is money. It's saying you won't do anything without taking up an offering for it. So, so wicked. Like it says in the book of Peter, it says the false prophets make merchandise of their entire congregation. But the congregation just goes right along with it. I mean, they don't even... How can you not tell if, if a preacher, if he constantly is just... All he talks about is you need to pay tithes. That's all he cares about is money. I mean, it's easy. But so many people, they just... They're, they're blind to it. They're, like it says in the book of Timothy... Their conscience is seared over with the hot iron. Their minds are completely numb because they listened to junk for so long in a church system and they never actually heard the word of God. Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And it, it, it is today. I mean, Jesus Christ is worshipped all over the world, but this will even more so be the case in the millennium at that time when the true Jesus Christ does return. Like I said, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and eternal life is for whomsoever will. Every people, every race, if they love Jesus Christ, they are blessed and they will live forever. And there will finally come a time, ultimately, where there will be no false gods. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name. And a pure offering, a, a pure worship of God. Not traditions, not rituals, but just worshiping God how He told us to. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, in that you say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even His meat, is contemptible. That's what the false prophets say. 
They say that don't you don't need to take time to study God's word. And remember, remember at the end of Hebrews chapter 5, where it says many of you have been in churches so long, you should have been teachers by now, but you've never been taught the word of God, really, so you're just stuck on milk. And you have need that you be taught the basics over and over and over. No, you're supposed to teach the meat of God's word. The entire Bible, verse by verse, exactly as it's written. But the false prophets say, you don't need to take that time. That is too much work. And that's exactly what it's going to say in the next verse. Let's go. Verse 13. You said also, behold, what a weariness is it. They say it's too much work to study God's word. They say that they're too busy doing all this church stuff, all this religion. Oh, I'm too tired now that I do all this. I sure don't have time to study God's word. That's what the false prophets say. Why would you ever follow somebody like that? But so many people do. And he hath snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And he brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus she brought an, off the, she brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? And he's not going to accept it. When it was the time of burnt sacrifice and offerings, the sacrifice you were supposed to bring had to be perfect and without blemish. If it wasn't, God wasn't going to accept it. And you see, the, none of us can be perfect. But the way that you worship God can be perfect. Because all you have to do is do exactly what the Word of God says. But if you want to worship God in a way that's all traditions of men, that's just a whole bunch of religion, but it's just all nonsense, God's not going to accept it. And even if, if you think you're doing the right thing, you better make sure what you're doing. If you're doing something that has to do with religion, but it's not in God's Word, then why are you doing it? You're learning your religion from a man instead of learning it from God's word. Verse 14. But cursed be the deceiver, which had in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrificed unto the Lord a corrupt thing. This is saying even somebody, he knows the truth. And he's, he's going to be a preacher. He vows to God that he's going to be the best preacher he can be. But then he offers a corrupt thing. He never teaches God's word. He prophesies out of his own mouth, just false doctrine, telling stories and doing this and that, something so religious. But if it's not God's word, then it's corrupt. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. It's awe-inspiring. And for all people, if you love God, you have his blessings. But if you go against God, and even if you think that you're doing what's right, but you're not doing according to what God said to do in His Word, then you got curses coming down on you. Let's go into chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you have any doubt of who this is written to, it's written to all people, but especially to those who claim to be preachers. So you better listen up. Verse 2. If you will not hear, this word hear means to hear with intelligently and with obedience. If you will not hear... And if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. And that even in the Hebrew, it says that God will even give you confusion. And you see, so many people, they seek their own glory. They want people to worship them, basically. They just want to be someone so holy and special. But God said, no, you need to give glory to my name. But if you don't want to do that, God's going to bring cursings down on you. That's exactly what it says in Leviticus chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you serve the God the way you want, you, you got blessings coming. But if you don't, if you go against God, if, and it says if you don't listen to Him and hearken to His commandments, it says God's going to bring so many cursings upon you that you're going to have cursings until you're just completely destroyed. It says God's going to take every single thing you touch and destroy it. That's what you got coming if you want to play church, if you want to play religion. Verse 3. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your soul and feast. Even the stuff that you, you went to church and claimed it was so religious, it was like dung in God's eyes. If his word's not taught, you understand that? And even though it's a solemn feast, seems so holy. And one shall take you away with it. That last phrase, it means that just like the dung's thrown out, God's going to throw you out right along with it. That's how God looks at you if you're a false teacher. If you don't teach the entire word exactly as it's written, but you play church, you're just like dung in God's eyes. You're going to be thrown out. You're going to be cast out. 
It's like in Matthew chapter 11, I believe it is, when the man, it's time for the great wedding and the return of Jesus Christ. But then he tries to go in, doesn't have a wedding garment, and he's speechless. God says, Jesus Christ says, cast him out into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because he claimed to be a Christian, did all this stuff that was so religious. But then when the false Christ, when the false Christ arrived first, he never studied God's word to know that it was the false Christ. So he worshipped him thinking that he was Christ. You think you're going to take part in that great wedding if you worship Satan in the last two and a half months? Absolutely not. See, that, that's the risk that you run. You claim to be a preacher, but you don't teach God's word? You're not only going to be deceived and worship the devil yourself, you're going to lead your whole congregation into worshiping the false Christ. Verse 5. Verse 4, that is. Verse 4. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. It was the Levitical priesthood, the tribe of Levi, that God chose to be the priest. Let's go to the verse, verse 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace. If you teach God's word exactly as it's written, you have eternal life and you have so much peace that this word, that this world sure cannot give you. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. And was afraid before my name. He would, once again, God is awe inspiring. And those who truly serve God, they are in awe of His greatness and His love and His mercy. But this is also saying it doesn't matter who you are. If you go against God, cursings are going to come down. Like Nadab and Abihu, that they offered strange fire on the altar. They were serving God in a way that they weren't supposed to. They had just became priests. What happened? God struck them dead right there. And, it, and that, that was their flesh, but it's a whole lot worse. Your eternal life is at stake if you want to claim to be a preacher, but you don't take the time to diligently study in God's Word to make sure that you're teaching it exactly what God meant by it. You have to do your homework. Verse 6. The law of truth was in his mouth. That means he taught God's Word. And iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity. He walked that straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life. And did turn many away from iniquity because he taught God's words. That's what turned people away from unrighteousness. That's what changes lives. Not a preacher just up there talking, telling stories, just making things sound really good. No, it's God's word that changes lives. It's God's word that turns you away from wickedness and gives you peace of mind that looses you out of the shackles. It's only God's word that can do that. But a lot of people, they don't want to hear the truth. What's it say in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 10? The people are saying, don't prophesy to us straightforward things. They say, prophesy deceits. Just teach us smooth words. They don't want to hear the truth. They just want to hear that they're going to be gone, that they're going to rapture away and just do whatever you want until then. Just believe what's well, a lie. And because they decided to go that way, they are going to worship the false Christ, which is Satan when he arrives at the sixth trumpet, disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. They're going to worship him if they don't study God's word, if they don't even know it's going to happen. Verse 7. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. That's what you should go to church to hear is the word of God taught. Not a bunch of religion, not a bunch of traditions, not whatever a man speaks. You go to church, you should be going to hear the word of God out of the preacher's mouth. Because it doesn't matter what any man says. It only matters what God says. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts because he's supposed to relay God's message. Verse 8. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. And you know, like you read in the book of Peter, that even Christ becomes a stumbling block. Well, how could that be? Because of what I just said. They don't know that the false Christ comes first. They love Christ, but then they're deceived by the false one. They do stumble when the word of God is not taught. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. You corrupted the whole priesthood. If you claim to be a preacher, but you don't teach God's word. Verse 9. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways, 
but I've been partial in the law. That means that you show partiality, you show favoritism. You see, that, that, that would be like, like if you come into a church and someone that has a whole lot of money, then they say, oh, hey, do whatever you want. Don't really worry about serving God and don't really worry about following His commandments. Just pay tithes. You can do whatever you want as long as you keep coming in and giving us all that tithe money. That's what it means to be partial in the law. But someone who doesn't have enough, they say, hey, you don't do this and that, you're going to hell. That's what it means to be partial in the law. Pure wickedness. I want to expand on this just a little bit to end this study. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 7. Think this all isn't written in the New Testament? Of course it is. Mark chapter 7, we're going to pick it up, verse 5, about these, this corrupted priesthood, these corrupted preachers in this world. Mark chapter 7, verse 5, and it reads, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why, not, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? They didn't say, why don't you follow God's word? They said, why don't you follow the traditions of the elders? Guess what? Traditions of the elders are meaningless, worthless. Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 through 22 lets you know that traditions of men are absolutely worthless. It says it might look real holy, but it says it's not going to do anything for you. Quite the contrary, it turns you away from God and His Word the more traditions and rituals you build up. Verse 6, He answered, that He being Jesus Christ, answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah, that's Isaiah, prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. I mean, you just your whole religion is worthless if you don't teach God's word. It's in vain. And like it says in Matthew 16, verse 12, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beware of any doctrine. You better check out anything I say or anything other preacher says. You better make sure it comes straight from the word of God. If it doesn't, then it's false. Verse, uh, verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things like ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. I hope that you would never do that. But so many people in many churches, many different denominations, they say, oh, we have to follow this tradition. This is what our church teaches us. We know that our church is right. Well, if it's not written in God's Word, then why do you think that? If what they say is not written in God's Word, why do you believe it? You reject the commandment of God when you decide to only follow the traditions of men. Verse 10. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, and Exodus chapter 21, verse 17. Verse 11. But ye say... If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corbin, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall, he shall be free, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. You know what this is saying? What the false prophets say, they say, as long as you pay tithes to me, you can just let your mother or your father starve. You don't have to honor them. That's what so many false prophets say. That's what so many preachers say. Just pay tithes. You can do anything you want. What a bunch of garbage. But people just eat it up. They just, they really think, how could you think that's right? I, I don't know. But they really think that people that just, all they preach about is paying tithes over and over and over. They think that that's what God wants. Now, make no mistake, it, it is biblical to, to pay tithes. But that's not what you're supposed to teach about nonstop. We, the only time that we ever mention tithes is if it comes up in God's word. We don't pass a plate. We don't, we don't try to beg. God said, don't, God did not send out beggars. When he, sent the, when he sent the apostles out, he said, don't take a script with you. A script is a begging bag. You're not supposed to beg. You just teach the word of God. If you teach God's word exactly as it's written, God will make sure you have whatever you need to keep that church going, whether it be through tithes or, or whatever. So it doesn't need to be preached over and over and over. Very rarely does it ever need to be mentioned because it's rarely mentioned in God's Word. It's there, 
But you know, like I said, it's really easy to know what a preacher cares about. If they're, talk, if they're constantly talking about tithes, they just want your money. You're nothing but merchandise to them. But if they teach God the word, that's what they care about. Verse 13 and complete. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things do ye. I hope that you never forget that verse. Traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. And I'll say it one more time. Many churches, they wouldn't even think about teaching the book of Malachi. Basically, the whole book, more or less, letting you know there's a whole lot of false prophets out there. They do all these things that is so religious. It seems so holy, but it's corrupt. It's like sacrificing a lamb or a sick animal. That's all it is. God is not going to accept it, even though they claim that they're men of God. But they're a bunch of liars if they don't teach God's word. So you test out your teacher, your preacher. When you go to church, do you remember what it said? That they should go to hear the law of the word of God out of the preacher's mouth. Not a bunch of other junk. So you test your preachers out. Don't take my word or any other man's word for what they say. It's not in God's word. Men's words are meaningless. It's only God's word that matters. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for warning us over and over about the false prophets. We thank you for giving us the understanding of your word so we can, we can spot it easily. We thank you for your written word and for get, t telling us all things. We thank you for giving us this building. We can come and teach your word exactly as it's written. That no one can tell us, can't teach this or that, but you just gave us this place where we can teach your entire word. and We can't ever thank you enough for that. We just ask you to continue to give us wisdom, so not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, in Jesus' precious name, amen. This is recorded February the 7th, 2021, at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.